The Song of Solomon. Commentary by A. F. Ausset. Introduction. The Song of Solomon, called in the Vulgate and Septuagint, The Song of Songs, from the opening words. This title denotes its superior excellence, according to the Hebrew idiom, so holy of holies, equivalent to most holy, Exodus 29, 37, the heaven of heavens, equivalent to the highest heavens. Deuteronomy 10, 14. It is one of the five volumes, Megilloth, placed immediately after the Pentateuch in manuscripts of the Jewish scriptures. It is also fourth of the Hagiographer, Setubim, writings, or the third division of the Old Testament, the other two being the Law and the Prophets. The Jewish enumeration of the Setubim is Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Canticles, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther, Daniel, Ezra, including Nehemiah, and Chronicles. Its canonicity is certain, it is found in all Hebrew manuscripts of Scripture, also in the Greek Septuagint, in the catalogues of Melito, Bishop of Sardis, AD 170, Eusebius, Ecclesiastical History, 4.26, and of others of the ancient church. Origen and Jerome tell us that the Jews forbade it to be read by any until he was thirty years old. It certainly needs a degree of spiritual maturity to enter right into the holy mystery of love which it allegorically sets forth. To such as have attained this maturity, of whatever age they be, the Song of Songs is one of the most edifying of the sacred writings. Rose and Muller justly says, the sudden transitions of the bride from the court to the grove are inexplicable, on the supposition that it describes merely human love. Had it been the latter, it would have been positively objectionable, and never would have been inserted in the holy canon. The allusion to Pharaoh's chariots, Song of Solomon 1, 9, has been made a ground for conjecturing that the love of Solomon and Pharaoh's daughter is the subject of the song but this passage alludes to a remarkable event in the history of the Old Testament church, the deliverance from the hosts and chariots of Pharaoh at the Red Sea. However, see on Song of Solomon 1, 9. The other allusions are quite opposed to the notion, the bride is represented at times as a shepherdess, Song of Solomon 1, 7, an abomination to the Egyptians, Genesis 46, 34. So also Song of Solomon 1, 6, 3, 4, 4, 8, 5, 7 are at variance with it. The Christian fathers, Origen and Theodoret, compared the teachings of Solomon to a ladder with three steps, Ecclesiastes, natural, the nature of sensible things, vain, proverbs, moral, canticles, mystical, figuring the union of Christ and the church. The Jews compared Proverbs to the outer court of Solomon's temple, Ecclesiastes to the holy place, and Canticles to the holy of holies. Understood allegorically, the song is cleared of all difficulty. Shilamith, Song of Solomon 6, 13, the bride, is thus an appropriate name, daughter of peace being the feminine of Solomon, equivalent to the prince of peace. She by turns is a vine dresser, shepherdess. Midnight Inquirer, and Prince's Consort and Daughter, and he a suppliant drenched with night dews, and a king in his palace, in harmony with the various relations of the Church and Christ. As Ecclesiastes sets forth the vanity of love of the creature, Canticles sets forth the fullness of the love which joins believers and the Saviour. The entire economy of salvation, says Harris, aims at restoring to the world the lost spirit of love. God is love and Christ is the embodiment of the love of God. As the other books of scripture present severally their own aspects of divine truth, so Canticles furnishes the believer with language of holy love, wherewith his heart can commune with his Lord, and it portrays the intensity of Christ's love to him. The affection of love was created in man to be a transcript of the divine love, and the song clothes the latter in words, were it not for this, we should be at a loss for language, having the divine warrant, wherewith to express, without presumption, the fervour of the love between Christ and us. The image of a bride, a bridegroom, and a marriage, to represent this spiritual union, has the sanction of scripture throughout.
nay, the spiritual union was the original fact in the mind of God, of which marriage is the transcript, Isaiah 54, 5, 62, 5, Jeremiah 3, 1, etc., Ezekiel 16, 1 to 63, 23, 1 to 49, Matthew 9, 15, 22, 2, 25, 1, etc., John 3, 29, 2 Corinthians 11, 2, Ephesians 5, 23 to 32, where Paul does not go from the marriage relation to the union of Christ and the church as if the former were the first, but comes down from the latter as the first and best recognized fact on which the relation of marriage is based, Revelation 19, 7, 21, 2, 22, 17. Above all, the song seems to correspond to, and form a trilogy with, Psalms 45 and 72, which contain the same imagery, just as Psalm 37 answers to Proverbs, and the Psalms 39 and 73 to Job. Love to Christ is the strongest, as it is the purest, of human passions, and therefore needs the strongest language to express it, to the pure in heart the phraseology, drawn from the rich imagery of oriental poetry, will not only appear not indelicate or exaggerated, but even below the reality. A single emblem is a type. The actual rites, incidents, and persons of the Old Testament were appointed types of truths afterwards to be revealed. But the allegory is a continued metaphor, in which the circumstances are palpably often purely imagery, while the thing signified is altogether real. The clue to the meaning of the song is not to be looked for in the allegory itself, but in other parts of scripture. It lies in the casket of revelation an exquisite gem, engraved with emblematical characters, with nothing literal thereon to break the consistency of their beauty, burrows. This accounts for the name of God not occurring in it. Whereas in the parable the writer narrates, in the allegory he never does so. The song throughout consists of immediate addresses either of Christ to the soul, or of the soul to Christ. The experimental knowledge of Christ's loveliness and the believer's love is the best commentary on the whole of this allegorical song, Leighton. Like the curiously wrought oriental lamps, which do not reveal the beauty of their transparent emblems until lighted up within, so the types and allegories of scripture. The lantern to our path, Psalms 119, 105, need the inner light of the Holy Spirit of Jesus to reveal their significance. The details of the allegory are not to be too minutely pressed. In the song, with an oriental profusion of imagery, numbers of lovely, sensible objects are aggregated not strictly congruous, but portraying jointly by their very diversity the thousand various and seemingly opposite beauties which meet together in Christ. The unity of subject throughout, and the recurrence of the same expressions, Song of Solomon 2, 6, 7, 3, 5, 8, 3, 4, 2, 16, 6, 3, 7, 10, 3, 6, 6, 10, 8, 5, prove the unity of the poem, in opposition to those who make it consist of a number of separate erotic songs. The sudden transitions, for example, from the midnight knocking at a humble cottage to a glorious description of the king, accord with the alternations in the believer's experience. However various the divisions assigned be, most commentators have observed four breaks, whatever more they have imagined, followed by four abrupt beginnings, Song of Solomon 2, 7, 3, 5, 5, 1, 8, 4. Thus there result five parts, all alike ending in full repose and refreshment. We read, 1 Kings 4, 32, that Solomon's songs were a thousand and five. The odd number five added over the complete thousand makes it not unlikely that the five refers to the Song of Songs, consisting of five parts. It answers to the idyllic poetry of other nations. The Jews explain it of the union of Jehovah and ancient Israel, the allusions to the temple and the wilderness accord with this, some Christians of Christ and the Church, others of Christ and the individual believer. All these are true, for the Church is one in all ages. The ancient typifying the modern Church, 
and its history answering to that of each individual soul in it. Jesus sees all, as if that all were one, loves one, as if that one were all. The time suited the manner of this revelation, because types and allegories belonged to the old dispensation, which reached its ripeness under Solomon, when the temple was built, Moody Stuart. The daughter of Zion at that time was openly married to Jehovah, for it is thenceforth that the prophets, in reproving Israel's subsequent sin, speak of it as a breach of her marriage covenant. The songs heretofore sung by her were the preparatory hymns of her childhood. The last and crowning song of songs was prepared for the now mature maiden against the day of her marriage to the king of kings, Origen. Solomon was peculiarly fitted to clothe this holy mystery with the lovely natural imagery with which the song abounds, for he spake of trees, from the cedar in Lebanon, even unto the hyssop that springeth out of the wall, 1 Kings 4, 33. A higher qualification was his knowledge of the eternal wisdom or word of God, Proverbs 8, 1-36. The heavenly bridegroom. David, his father, had prepared the way, in Psalms 45 and 72, the son perfected the allegory. It seems to have been written in early life, long before his declension, for after it a song of holy gladness would hardly be appropriate. It was the song of his first love, in the kindness of his youthful espousals to Jehovah. Like other inspired books, its sense is not to be restricted to that local and temporary one in which the writer may have understood it, it extends to all ages and shadows forth everlasting truth, 1 Peter 1, 11, 12, 2 Peter 1, 20, 21. O oh, that I knew how all thy lights combine, and the configurations of their glory! Seeing not only how each verse doth shine, but all the constellations of the story, Herbert. Three notes of time occur, Moody Stewart, 1. The Jewish Church speaks of the Gentile Church, Song of Solomon 8, 8, towards the end, 2, Christ speaks to the Apostles, Song of Solomon 5, 1, in the middle, 3, the Church speaks of the coming of Christ, Song of Solomon 1, 2, at the beginning. Thus we have, in direct order, Christ about to come, and the cry for the advent, Christ finishing his work on earth and the Last Supper, Christ ascended, and the call of the Gentiles. In another aspect we have, 1, in the individual soul the longing for the manifestation of Christ to it, and the various alternations in its experience, Song of Solomon 1, 2, 4, 2, 8, 3, 1, 4, 6, 7, of his manifestation, 2, the abundant enjoyment of his sensible consolations, which is soon withdrawn through the bride's carelessness, Song of Solomon 5, 1 to 3, etc., and her longings after him, and reconciliation, Song of Solomon 5, 8 to 16, 6, 3, etc., Song of Solomon 7, 1, etc., 3, effects of Christ's manifestation on the believer, namely, assurance, labors of love, anxiety for the salvation of the impenitent, eagerness for the Lord's second coming, Song of Solomon 7, 10, 12, 8, 8-10, 14, 